welcome to the discussion episode of Series 25, Golden Sky Stories. Unfortunately, Amelia was unable to join us for this one, but it is still well worth a listen. A lot of Kickstarters have wrapped up recently, but there's still some out there that need your help if you're able to pitch in. Uh, Kevin Petker's Princess World is in the last hours as of the release of this episode, so if you're interested in a really cool take on PBTA games while also having a good resource for kids to play, you should definitely check that one out. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. Um, Another cool one that we have heard about recently and we'll actually be discussing a little bit in next week's Character Evolution Cast episode is uh, a virtual tabletop called Multiverse. Uh, It looks like it brings some really cool sprite-based graphics to the virtual game board. Um, Looks really interesting. Uh, I've been hearing a lot about this on Twitter. Uh, So check that out as well uh, if you're interested in that. Uh, And there's still plenty of time in that Kickstarter out there. So uh, if you're looking for something cool to throw your money at, if you have any available, uh, definitely uh, check those out. We did get one new review since last week, so we do have something to read here again. If you want to help us out for next time, though, when we record this cold open, please leave us a rating or review and review. Both. Both are important. We can't read ratings. We can't read ratings. We could. Five stars. Five stars. Five yep. stars. One Five star. Stars. By anonymous user. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> please leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or the podcatcher of your choice, and we will read it out here and thank you personally, like we are about to do, for this review from Siadasti from the United States of America on iTunes, titled The Best Part of Playing Games is Character Creation. The best so, part of playing, playing games, games is character, is character creation. creation. We sang it for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, the best part of playing games is character creation. So many cool games I wouldn't otherwise hear about, and the character creation gives you a pretty good idea of what the game is about. The hosts are earnest without being annoying, knowledgeable without being overbearing, and delightful without reservation. Without oh. reservation. <laughs> delightful so without much. reservation. That's mostly Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess that's infectious. I guess. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much. That's a super sweet review. It was. I, I really liked you in that one. Thank you so much, Tia Dusty. With all of that out of the way, here's the episode. Yeah, enjoy. Welcome back to our discussion episode, everyone. Last time, we created characters for Golden Sky Stories. This episode, we will be discussing the character creation process. Unfortunately, Amelia is not able to join us for this discussion episode, but we are very excited to welcome back David Gunsberg and Morgan Jenkins. Do you two want to go ahead and reintroduce yourselves and uh, for everyone at home and tell us a little bit about the characters that you made last episode? I would love to do that. Hi, my name is David Gunsberg. I'm a long-time game runner, game designer, and putative podcaster down in Australia. Uh, Waves upside downedly from uh, the other end of the planet for most of you. Uh, And last time, I made a very lovable doofus dog called Hoshi, uh, who um, feels very protective and affectionate to the whole world and is basically a forever 11-year-old boy in human form, wearing daggy clothes and a cap he's not convinced he's wearing. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, she's such a good boy. He is. Mm -hmm. And I am Morgan Jenkins, and I do... I I turn up in a lot of places, but Mm -hmm. I have a podcast called Going In Blind with vision-impaired players playing 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, and then my voice appears elsewhere. Good luck finding it. Um, and I chose to make last time a burb called Karasu, who was a crow. Um, and when I'm not in crow form, I tend to wander around with long black hair, uh, eyeliner, 
long black clothes. Basically, I'm a goth, but I've, I've got feathered bracelets because mm-hmm. I'm a burb goth. Super cool. <laughs> Um, and then Amelia, uh, she created a Shiro, a uh, white-haired fox uh, who is super old, uh, wears a cardigan, and uh, I don't remember too much else about that character, and Amelia's not here, so we'll move on to my character, Lady Sakura Flufferton, uh, who is a very floofy gray cla- cat with wild uh, dark gray hair. Uh, when uh, she is a human uh, 18-year-old individual. Um, Although in her uh, cat form, she's actually 39, which is quite old for a cat. Um, And she likes to hang out in the rooftop gardens of town, uh, especially with a particular older lady that uh, she gets to keep company while she gardens all day in her retired old age. Sakura so, is a very good floof. Yeah. Right? Got, got, almost got floof in her name. <laughs> Flooferton. Uh, so let's go ahead, now that we remember what our characters are, uh, and dive right into a segment that we are calling D20 for Your Thoughts. D20 for Your Thoughts? All right. In this segment, we want to talk to our guests about their thoughts on the character creation process and how it relates to this system and to other games. But first, we'd like to get to know our guests a bit better. Uh, So we are going to get the cliche question out of the way. And can you both tell us how you got into RPGs in the first place? Oh, where to start? I mean, I first got into RPGs in a boarding school that I did not attend um, where my mother worked and as a small distracting child, I was sent off to go torture some of the students and they happened to be playing some strange game around a table with dice and it looked interesting and they very foolishly invited me up and let me play. And that was my <laughs> first introduction to Dungeons and Dragons and it wasn't for years later that a friend of mine then introduced me to third edition just as 3.5 was coming out and I went, oh, this seems somewhat familiar but a little bit less insane than when I last played it. Uh, <laughs> but it did take me a good four sessions to realise I was playing the same game. So that's that's kind of how I discovered RPGs. Um, and then move very quickly from there to many other RPGs, a lot of them powered by the apocalypse, and discovered mm-hmm. live-action RPGs, which are, mm-hmm. it's like theatre, but you get to throw fireballs at people. And that's, yeah, that's pretty much my journey into the bright and wondrous world that is role-playing games. Yeah, very cool. How about yourself, David? I was... um like so many people introduced via some a friend of mine's big brother mm. who we used to go around to their place and play board games and stuff and he had this box i never saw the cover of it and the it, it, i think it was one of the original uh, mensa white boxes potentially okay um and we just had no we all knew what we had was something different but we didn't know what it was like there was no we were looking for the start here and the um, how do all these rules plug together? Yeah. And I can't explain how, but I had that feeling of there's something here. Um, we He had the B1 Descent into the Unknown module, which we all read together um, <laughs> and and like looked at the these rooms and when it doesn't tell us which order to do these in. And because there was no internet, there was no way of finding out that, look, it's entirely up to you. There's no yeah, – we had the, the B1 – uh, descent. Oh, now I've thrown it. Anyway, uh, I ended up going to my local bookstore to try and find it, and they were literally just putting out the first player's handbook of the monster manual. <laughs> and I saved up, uh, and I bought them both the one with the really bad line art with the um, uh, I think it's the roper hanging upside down from the roof with the unicorn on the front, uh, and the, the old PHB, and just inhaled them and then smuggled them into the Catholic boys' school that I was going to and recruited my friends into playing. Mm. Um, and like so many people, when I discovered that there was a, what do you want to do now? You can do anything you want. Uh, that blew my mind and I desperately wanted to play, but I became the forever DM. Oh, yeah. 
and um, now I've kind of full full circle of life. Run a campaign for my kids and run a campaign for my friends, and yeah, I I, I love the power of connection that you get from RPGs. Absolutely, very cool. Well, can you both tell us then about your personal process for picking and creating characters in any role playing system? I don't get to create many character characters. The the few that I do when I get let out from behind the the game running screen for whatever system we're running mm-hmm. is I usually try and pick either a part of myself that I want to explore and build out from or I try and think about a a part of myself that I wish I had and try and build back towards me from that because I genuinely believe that you know you can games change you uh, and you get to deeply and immersively inhabit a place and I want to try and inhabit places that are good for me as as a person so either exploring something about myself that I like or trying to build something in myself through exploring the character but as a game master when I'm creating NPCs uh, I'm, I'm often looking across the table to think about what what in the lives of the players can we explore by putting an NPC in front of their character mm. that will also let them go on that um, transcendent journey of you don't realise that the you know the real dungeon is ourselves. <laughs> uh, do you know what I mean? The real uh, dragon is ourselves too. Whoa! Exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> the that, dragon was where, inside us all along. Yeah. So that that's. Um, that's kind of how I approach it. Wow. That's that is the- so wholesome and holistic and 100% not how I've ever approached ever playing a game of Dungeons & Dragons or any role-playing game. I have always – I prefer – it's funny that you you say that you, you got relegated to DMing uh, but would like to play more characters. I love DMing and I – I'm so bad at playing characters that they almost always turn into some weird uh the word when you're trying to words are failing me uh stereotype there we go they mm-hmm. uh, they turn into some weird stereotype and it's almost that a lot of the time and it's only in hindsight that I've learned this but my personal process for picking and creating a character in a role playing system was almost always What's annoying me and what do I need to work my way through? So a lot of my early characters, weirdly, were big jocks, lots of tanks, possibly very good at sports ball, had very low opinions about about geeks. Um, No idea what I was trying to work through there. Uh, (laughs) And then at a certain point, they switched to being people who were... Uh, trapped in the wrong body or they'd gone through a Freaky Friday situation and it had gone wrong or uh, they were um, th- yeah there was there was one I played in um, a game of masks where her whole thing was she woke up in the body of a security guard who's this big burly guy and everyone looks at her like she's the wrong gender and let's mm. not unpack that for 30 years and <laughs> it, it was it was about yeah, it was it was about using role playing to kind of work through my own uh, mm-hmm. anguish and angst, basically. And I would then come to a game with an idea of the type of character or problem I was working through, and then reverse engineer through the mechanics to create that. Oh yeah, absolutely. And and it's it's awesome how in role playing games you can have that safe space to explore uh, either either different. Uh, scenarios of our own psyche or uh, exploring the psyches of others in order to have better empathy. Oh, yes, that is that is 100% what I was doing. I was very empathetic towards those big dumb jocks. Well, at least to try to understand (laughs) (laughs) their mentality a little bit. Uh, I, yes, let's go with that. (laughs) I'm sure there's other reasons for that, too. <laughs> so let's go ahead and uh, talk a bit more about uh, Golden Sky Stories. Um, how do we think character creation in this game stacks up to other systems that we've played? Well, I'd, I'd love to hear your answer to that first. Um, 
My goodness. It was, um, it was a lot simpler than most, right? Um, the, the fact that it's, it's diceless kind of threw me off at first, (laughs) but, but the fact that your stats are, it, it feels to me like your stats grow throughout the game and then you spend them to do things, right? Yeah. Is that, is that kind of... That's exactly def- right. Okay. So so I, I picked up on that, but I wasn't 100% sure on that, but I hadn't read the rules, so that's okay. Um, but it was, it was a really interesting take on um, uh, just pick your true form and figure out what you look like when you turn into a human and here's some abilities that you can pick as well and some some abilities that you can have weaknesses attached to as well that do extra cool things i think in the the full core game um i think morgan you pointed out that there were extra things that you could choose from yeah, the the when you when you get into the book and get down de- and one thing we didn't mention last uh episode, but one thing that I love is the way the book is set out in in a way to almost pull you into the, the narrative feel of, of the stories you're going to be telling with your table. It, yeah. it, it sets itself up as it as it takes you through character creation and then um th- through kind of exp- exploring the expansion beyond your character into the town into community and creation and ongoing stories and and uh, leveling up your character for want of a better word it it does yeah. it in terms of seasons so instead of chapters it's it's spring and then summer and then winter and then mm. however seasons are supposed to go autumn's in there somewhere except you call <laughs> it fall because the leaves fall we, down we we swap between the two Oh, that's that's unhelpful. Although to be fair, I did call a truck a lorry yesterday and got in trouble for it. So, oh. <laughs> um, apparently, we don't do that in Australia. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> it's the first I've heard of it. Uh, but they, they they have everything um, set out almost in terms of seasons. So, as the year progresses in the book, you progress through the game, which I thought was quite lovely and 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 fun. But it also, um, and I've forgotten the question you asked. The uh, how how this stacks up to other games? Oh no no the, the very specific Character question creation. sorry oh yes um it, it was how uh, that there are extra weaknesses and yeah in, yeah in that section where you're creating the characters um underneath all what the fox does and and the the bird does and the the garbage panda raccoon thing um <laughs> it, 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 they they all have a, a, a good couple of pages of hmm. of of powers um and then underneath the powers you have the weaknesses with the additional powers and so mm-hmm. for instance i'm looking at the fox powers now and beyond what you have in the quick start guide you have these fantastic things like uh fried tofu which apparently makes you a liar um oh Oh wait, no! Fried tofu is the weakness. Fantastic, and liar is the additional power, and Whoa. and and it's just these fun, strange little powers and weaknesses that go above and beyond what you're already playing mm-hmm. with. So that, to me, that kind of leads into what I think is um, how I think it stacks up. In as much as it's a deceptively small game. Yeah, you you're looking for what else there is. Um, there's a single resource flow, and it has an abundance mentality built into it that basically mm-hmm. says if you lean into this and you continue to be kind to the characters around you and continue to build connection, you will become more quote unquote powerful. But the concept of powerful in this game is just to me so beautiful. Like the we talked about it last episode that the the powers are things like you know you can make it rain in a yeah. scene. Um. It's it's got such a different ethos behind it um, mm-hmm. that says all of the small things you'd gloss over are the big things. So the what do you look like in animal form and what do you look like in human form and how do those two relate mm-hmm. um, is given space to breathe and space to explore. You get to explore that in this game where in D and D you might just go yeah chainmail and a sword and a shield and got dragon on the front <laughs> yeah. Um, 
because it's got no mechanical impact. It's it's no it, it it's not going to Im- impede you in any way. Whereas understanding, you know, our three, sorry, our four characters, you know, form this unlikely group and imagining what they're going to look like as they're moving through the town and who they're going to interact with. Um, all those small things become material. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so I, I think it's got a quite a un, unique to me anyway feeling um, that um, really leans into and gestures to you as a player or as someone who's running the game saying everything about this has that feeling of of uh, gentleness. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, yeah. in the in the same way that. Uh, the mechanics of the game lead towards kindness and reward kindness and reward uh, both kindness in terms of actions within the game and in terms of you handing out kindness to others begets further kindness. Um, in the same way, these powers and weaknesses just give you so much uh, character um, and, like, and, and opportunities for growth and just fun, silly, weird little... For instance, the power liar gives you the ability to trick people uh, that you're talking to if, if they basically uh, fail an adult check against your, your henge attribute. But the weakness you take with it, which I mentioned before, was fried tofu, and I didn't realise this is what it does. But um, And I don't know that we touched on this last episode, but there are transitional periods between being human and being a- animal. So, for instance, mm. you can transform from one to the other, and it'll cost, say, four power to transform from animal to human. But mm-hmm. if you wanted to only spend two of that instead of the full four, you would transform into almost entirely a human, but not quite the whole way. Mm. So you would still have your tail or you would still have your ears. Um, uh, but you would, so like a fox tail, but you're, you're, you're looking human. And mm-hmm. the fried tofu weakness is that if you spot fried tofu, you love it so much, you just automatically partially come undone in your transformation so if you're fully human your ears <laughs> pop up or if your ears are already up your tail turns up and if you have ears and tails you go all the way back to to being a, a fox and all just because you've spotted this fried tofu that you love <laughs> and so it's a beautiful strange little fun weakness that you can play into and lead to fun silly little strange um parts of the adventure and stories or you know even fun things where it's like oh they've gone into the shop does the shop have tofu oh i can't go in there i'll have to find a different way and (laughs) that's amazing and it's just it's i i love that about this game is that it gives you these fun silly strange little moments uh, for instance, I remember there was a game I was playing where a dog kept trying to jump into a pond to catch a fish for me because I wanted a fish and I was a cat, but I had inability to swim and then I had to try and rescue the puppy, but I couldn't get in there. And it was just, it was a really fun, interesting quirk uh, to the game that came out of these weaknesses. If, yeah. If you take a, if you take a position of embracing whimsy as well as uh, embracing the kindness and connection component, you can just have a just a ton of really meaningful fun. Um, and I think that character creation and the mechanics are pointed squarely at that. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. How, how does the process then of character creation set a player's expectations for playing the game? Well, I, I th- having run it at cons, um, the some of the absences are notable. Mm -hmm. So, like, the the person who's looking for the where's my violence-related statistics can't find them because they're just not there. And the the concept of, like, what powerful looks like is you are more powerful at these weird, strange, poetic, haiku-like powers. Mm -hmm. Um, So, it it takes a little while. It's like tuning into an old-fashioned analogue radio. As you're going through it, you kind of... There's a period of confusion where you're going, wait, this doesn't look and feel like other things I've done. And and then it kind of clicks and crystallizes out and you, I personally, kind of get transported into a space that I don't, don't normally inhabit mm. in, my, in my gaming experiences. Um, so, I, I think that that's, that's fairly strong. Yeah, absolutely. And, like, the, um, the part where we were doing the relationships – 
uh, with one another, the, the little snippets of our past lives together, uh, was, uh, a, a nice little window into the slice of life world that this game is. Mm. Um, it, they're like little vignettes of, uh, of joy, uh, yeah. that, that, uh, kind of gives you a little foreshadowing of what the game's going to be about. Yeah, it's very much like the sort of Dungeon World connections or PBTA connections, but like with everything, the scale is deceptively small. So I remember that um, one of the connections was your two characters having like got trapped in a basement and found the perfect box (laughs) for the cat to sit in, Mm -hmm. whereas in other systems it might have been, do you remember that time we raided the Goblin King's Horde? Um, right. And, and, and the, that same connection mechanic, but one is telling you about the scale and flavour of that game and, and this informs the scale and flavour of this mm-hmm. one. And certainly as the book walks you through character creation, it, it also peppers in cultural notes and artwork and, and fun little asides and almost mm. its own little mini adventure told in story form that unfolds as you progress through your own creation. Mm-hmm. really helps give the flavor of what you're stepping into in terms of these mystical animals and what they do and, and how they present both within the game but also encouraging you to to take on that like I don't want it's almost like language bleed like you read mm-hmm. the the flow of these these sections in between and now here's what you do with the character and then they'll tell you about the bird and it it really is very uh, especially in the english translation very poetic and mm. it it puts you in a mindset uh that you then step into um your character creation and they actually lead out the character creation with a sample story so that just before you jump into it you really get a, a sense of the flavor of okay, here is how an adventure would go down, and then yeah. you can approach creating that character in that same manner. Yeah, Awen Clooney, who did the the translation, I think has done a wonderful job. Like the best, the the best game systems in, in just moving through the, the the rule book kind of just brings you into that space, and I think that do, this book does that really well. Mm. Now, if you if you listen to this and you decide to give it a go, the the demo version that we link to. You know, it's enough to get you started, but if you if you find that little first taste on the tip of your tongue makes you want to take a really big bite, then I can mm-hmm. definitely recommend the the book. Yeah, absolutely. Because I will say one thing that the um, the quick start guide doesn't bring across, and one thing that I think the DM then has to step up uh, to do is that in the same in the same way that I said that the book really gives you that flow of how to approach these adventures before you step into the character creation. The quick start guide doesn't give you as much of that. And mm. I think then the DM has to, who's familiar with the system, then has to be able to step up and encourage the players to, and, and basically have to, to tell everyone from the get go, this is a, a meditative a group meditation on kindness. This is, we're going to succeed. Uh, it's about, begetting kindness with more kindness, giving each other dreams, here are the mechanics, here's how it's going to function. And basically that's that's that can be a big ask if you're coming into a game to slay the dragon, to mm-hmm. have someone turn around and say, no, you're coming into this game to do a nice small thing with a bunch of other people and reward those people for also doing the nice small thing. Right. And and I, I I think usually usually that comes with like a scarcity mechanic mm. that if I've given that to you, I have less of the thing. Um, right. So there's an element of kind of stoking that fire of getting everyone to say, I like what you did. I like what mm-hmm. you did. So here's a thing that has an impact in game. Yeah. And, but I th- I, yeah, I think it means that you would have to have a very specific uh, way of bringing people into the game. Otherwise, you'd potentially, and 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 that goes for bringing them into the character creation as well, because mm-hmm. uh, otherwise they they may get uh, somewhat somewhat lost in the 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 lack of familiarity, as it were, mm-hmm. um, and then that can translate into the character creation and also into how they approach the gameplay aspect. That makes sense. So, what would we think then is uh, probably the biggest flaw of character creation in this system? I, I think that if you are coming in cold, 
Yeah. Um, it does feel very foreign. Uh, and I don't mean that in a, you know, like a geography sense. I mean that in a mechanical gameplay sense. Um, it, it it can leave people, f- like, disorientated in a not good way. Mm-hmm. Um, and that the s- counterintuitively, the simplicity of the character creation, sometimes people who want to be able to have, I have a specific concept and I want to be able to explore everything and this is going, well, that's, the this game is vested in the collective story, not necessarily each one of our characters. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a limited choice, even in the full rule book, there's a limited choice. Okay. Uh, and there's not exhaustive options. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I think one of the downsides is it can potentially alienate people who who haven't done slice of life stuff before or who are concerned that a small story isn't going to have a, a fun payoff. I mean, we play to have fun, right? We play yeah. to explore ourselves and do those things. And, and from the outside looking in, you can it looks too lightweight to have an impact when this game has delivered some of the most impactful sessions I've had with people. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think that always lines up. So it's, it, it's, it's a good one to have um, someone go, guide you through uh, or failing that to, um, you know, because we live in the future, uh, there's a couple of really nice playthroughs on YouTube that you can watch to help you kind of grapple with that. Yeah, I I didn't um, think there was anything that like hugely stood out aside from that for flaws. And I think if I, if I had the full book in front of me, things would have made a little bit more sense at first. Um, but it, yeah, it, it, it works for what it needs to do. And it really gets the point across of this is the type of game you're going to be playing. So having a lack of details and all that sort of stuff, that's just a feature. And I think it can be intimidating for new players who are looking for lots of scaffolding. Yeah. Uh, where like again like with descent into midnight you kind of come going wait what it's it's all on this two pages and we haven't even got the world yet yeah and that whole you've actually got to relax mm-hmm. Th- there is enough going on here that a story will just generate out of what we're putting out there yeah um but if you if you if you're used to you know, other systems that you, you you draw a sense of comfort from. I have my fistful of dice and I have my six-page character sheet and I can see you as the game master have a big screen and a pile of books. I know we're not going to be short of content. We will be having a game. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. That seeing so little and no dice at mm-hmm. cons, people are like, what dice do I need? And I go, none. We've got these, you know, random colored buttons that we're going to use as our kindness tokens. Yeah. Um, is, is a very different thing. It is. Absolutely. All right. So I wanted to, uh, we don't get to ask this question too often. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, playing an animal character <laughs> versus playing a person. Um, what do you see as the challenges uh, and benefits of of doing so in a game like this, especially? Oh, I mean, I know for me, especially anytime I'm playing uh, a cat, it's mostly just in in the same way that I would play a, a a jock in order to garner, let's call it empathy for them. Whenever I <laughs> whenever I play a cat, they're normally all the unhelpful habits that my particular cat has been exhibiting in the last week or so writ large on the large on the big screen. Uh, so I, I tend to be thoroughly uh, unhelpful. And 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 then I said, Morgan, what are you doing that for? I'm like, because Bernard did it at six in the morning. Um, so <laughs> uh, there's there's that you you can um, it, it becomes a, a game of. What are the fun, weird little idiosyncrasies of the animals that I'm aware of, and how can I then present them in game form in a way that's not disruptive? Mm-hmm. But then mo- the thing that then comes to me is when your animal becomes human, how do you carry those forward? Very yeah. rarely when I play this game do I bring my character to the table as a person and then reverse engineer them towards an animal. It's always animal first. And then how Mm -hmm. do some of those strange little idiosyncrasies switch forward into, Mm -hmm. into a person. So, uh, as a, as a human, uh, 
presenting henge, I would, you know, if I was a cat, it would be a lot of, if I'm flustered, I, I self-soothe by grooming because mm-hmm. that's, that's how you do. Um, and and, the, and the, the game sets you up to sort of start from that animal mm. position. And I know we have mentioned this over and over, but I think they are spiritually related games. In the same way Descent into Midnight says that its, it's setting is a never has and never will have humans in it, mm-hmm. we, we are outsiders in human culture. Yeah. And it, 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 we set ourselves up as these mildly magical spirits spirits that live alongside and within human society but aren't active participants in it most of the time. You know, you can run a game where it's all very out in the open. But then when you transform, you get to experience that thing of looking at humanity from the outside. Mm. And uh, it tends to highlight the the angels of our better nature um, when, you know, you, ju- you, you just want to help the old lady get the flowers and take them up to the shrine. Yeah. Because from the outside you can you can see the beautifully human moments so clearly rather than being I'm another human. Mm-hmm. Um you you are literally a um uh, you know Rich Howard shout out don't be a human in a dolphin suit. The 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 flip side is that you really are a cat in a human suit. Uh you really and and to help you out you've brought a puppy in a human suit mm-hmm. and now we're going into a school to talk to some teachers. Like, it, 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 you are experiencing the outsiderness at a very profound level, which I think can be super fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's almost a, akin to, uh, like you said, Descent into Midnight, getting into that sort of alien mindset, that, that mindset of the other, um, that when you, when you try to um, transcend human... Uh, experience, kind of vision. yeah, like the Context. human experience uh, of of being able to um, experience life as a human being, and trying to to focus your thoughts into how does a, an ordinary cat or an ordinary bird experience the world, and now how does that viewpoint of the world expand to be what does this thing what does this creature think of humanity when they look at it from that perspective and also to, to what level do they even understand humanity because mm-hmm. a lot of the times i've i've played a character who you like to think oh you have a, you have a vague understanding of, of how this society works but you could play a a, a henge that is there to help the people but couldn't tell you what a sweet shop was and couldn't mm-hmm. has no idea how these people keep climbing inside and out of these large metal noisy things that then transfer them place to place and just finds the whole thing mystifying and strange and terrifying and at that point would probably have an adult of zero on the character sheet yeah but um and and so if in the in the way of a a, a cat might not understand what a car is or, or or how the niceties of society work. They can mm. be a human, but they're not very good at being human. Right. And you can you can bring that through and forward into the characters in strange and fascinating ways. And then yeah, you get absolutely. to share these small but profound moments of humanity that I like the way Morgan describes it often as saying, you're going to play from things that from the outside are small but are massive to the people in them. So mm-hmm. the game we played earlier this week, there was an an old woman who just wanted to get the right flowers to take to an offer tree for someone who they loved very much. Mm-hmm. And you get to remind yourself as as us, the human beings, that these small moments are deeply profound in each and every one of our memories. When you you think back on your schooling, when you think back on your first crush, um, there, there are a couple of these tiny little moments that are so mundane, but they just sing in your heart and sing mm-hmm. in your memory. And to e- even in playing pretend, share these with the humans that we aren't. You know, we get to see them do it and know that we've contributed to making that moment happen. Mm-hmm. Um, I think is a, just a fun place to inhabit and a meaningful place to inhabit. 
mm-hmm. when you when you're playing this kind of character as that sort of animal human hybrid. Absolutely, and I, I think there's something to say about um, specifically playing as a, a an animal that we recognize from our own world, um, looking uh, outward uh, at humanity. Um, is a lot different than, say, like trying to play an alien or trying to play Mm -hmm. a ghost or, you know, something otherworldly, but like um, is more unfamiliar, right? When you're playing these, or just an ordinary cat, just an ordinary dog, just an ordinary bird, whatever, um, there's there's something that's kind of special about that, right? Yeah. Well, it's like they're they're a lot more relevant and prevalent in our reality yeah and and because of that then when you layer the mysticism and 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 the spirituality in on top of that of now they're this mystical creature um Mm -hmm. it yeah it 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 just it really lends that air of magic because if you go it's a vampire everyone's like yep it sparkles it broods we get that um but if if it's a cat right up until it's not a cat Mm-hmm. then that's uh, almost a, a much more, not shocking, but revelatory transformation. Absolutely. And the the nature of this game, I don't think would work with aliens or ghosts or what have you, mm. because it, it's it's about, it, it probably would work. It, would, it probably wouldn't work as well. Um, yeah, you, you need the- I think you need that touchstone. The yeah. magic in the mundane. Exactly. So you've got this super mundane. Yeah, perfect uh, comment is perfect. Yeah. It's it's good. It's 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 just good. I cheated. I used <laughs> yeah. I used alliteration. That's always cheating. You did. That's not fair. <laughs> so let's talk a bit about uh the group cohesion, um, aka the fan fiction portion of our show. <laughs> Um, so we made these fantastic characters uh, with a few links uh, last episode. Um, what do we think we would be up to? Well, I mean, what would be a good scenario. This is the thing because we have, in terms of our connections amongst each other, we have those, but then we also have connections out into the world, and that's one of the best yeah. bits about building that connection is we have these different disparate threads that we can potentially pull on. So we have. I I vaguely remember. I want to say he was he was a mailman that was delivering mail that I would sit yeah, in the, the a, front of the basket of. Yeah, and you so, had a post carrier. Or yep, and like so that. so that's a potential in in terms of stories, and and then there's also the uh, the little old lady that um, that the the fox would talk to if memory served. Yep. Uh, the cat, the, 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 yeah. the rooftop gardener, the rooftop garden with the yeah, cat, the rooftop gardener, old lady. Yep, yeah, um, that's the one that my character went after. And so, so you would have these little decisions, like yeah, maybe, maybe the little old lady needs to get another bag of soil out of the basement, and it just so happened to have been the basement that we got trapped in the box in. Yeah, and so we would have to help her with her arthritic limbs get that that uh, bag of soil up to her rooftop mm-hmm. garden. Oh, so yeah. So if uh, I've, as a game master, thought a bit about, or game runner, thought a bit about this over the last week and <laughs> was thinking about the small but meaningful collisions we could create in the humans we were thinking mm. about um, and the intergenerational thing of, like, the 11-year-old that Hoshi the is is looking after the little soccer player mm-hmm. kicks the soccer ball up onto the rooftop garden <laughs> and and oh, yeah. damages some plants and creates just a small thing where you know we we would then want to go oh no uh-huh. the, the soccer ball broke the plants um, <laughs> and and we would just introduce this old woman to this young 11 year old soccer tomboy um, and and just be there for them, and because of the way the game's set up, she's not gonna. She might be a bit cross to start with, but then mm-hmm. explore what connection they find with each other. Yeah. Um, and then they're both fans of the boy band. Yeah, they're both fans <laughs> of a boy band, or 
<laughs> or you know, we need to uh, fold in the the purchase of the new pot, which is going to be delivered, uh, and so the, the then we can roll our postman in mm. that the the postman. Mm-hmm. is going to interact with the boy to buy the, the, the I think it wasn't a boy it was a tomboy girl mm. if I remember correctly the I'm sure the listeners will tell us but in my mind she's become the the tomboy <laughs> of that family that Hoshi's been looking after for hundreds of years uh-huh you know that the the pot arrives as a special delivery and the postman and the boy take it to the um, old lady on the rooftop garden and they might make a um uh, uh, you know, repot a plant. Now that sounds so small. Yeah, but we would be nudging them all the way along and and be yeah. around them and be around each other. And um, there would be the chance for Flufferton to have a conversation with the boy because uh, the, with a little girl um, that that would be in like a mixed henge form because they're eleven. They still see us and are okay yeah. with us. Uh, and again, and because it's it, it's multiple episodes, this is the kind of game that you would want to play again and again. So the first playthrough could be the pot, the second playthrough a soccer ball, the third playthrough you're dealing with another element of these. You know, maybe it's mm. just one of the one of the humans that you're interacting with that time. Then at some point, the pot gets broken, and then the the little kid puts it together and and kintsukis it up with some some gold dust that they mm-hmm. found and it's all about helping build these little moments that we can then step into and and how you would step into them and mm-hmm. and and in stepping in sorry to to jump no, no, on that please but do. um uh that when we built this party we had three characters that were very low in the adult stat mm-hmm. and the only character that had any decent adult was Amelia. Yes. Yeah. As a as a fox character they're the one that uh the closest to the gods and uh find humans very so she she would be the kind of party face but there would be I think a a, a lot of uh um <laughs> at the <laughs> shenanigans that the the dog and the and the boob and the cat made happen and yeah. then going, and the, uh, we're going to need you to go and talk to someone. And the, and the fact that it, it, within our group, we all have a better understanding of people, but not necessarily how to make decisions for and with those people. Yeah. And so it becomes this us having to almost explain humanity to our friend who can then explain how to help that humanity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've we've got all the insight, but are unable to act on it. <laughs> yeah, and our Kitsune is able to act on it, but is just uh, like thoroughly confused some, by the whole there, thing. Uh, uh, you know, there would be some beautiful moments of of. Yeah. It's like um, we've accidentally done a thing, <laughs> and now we need you to do a thing because of the thing we did. Yep. And we need you to talk to some people, which is totally your favorite thing. <laughs> um, and and I think that could be quite joyous uh, mm-hmm. knowing uh knowing that that journey will be okay mm. yeah and and we'll we'll end with the you know miyazaki soundtrack piano as we pan back from the town and everything is good mm-hmm. this this game sounds like um a storytelling meditation yeah where it just sounds so relaxing it like, really is I know. Oh my gosh, I want to play this so bad. <laughs> uh, the 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 offer is open anytime, and what with coronavirus, you know, my schedule might open up quite substantially <laughs> yeah. over the next few weeks. We're all in front of our computers from now on. Yeah, I have a feeling that I might be staying home as well sometime very soon. Mm. Uh, uh, working from home for the most part. Yeah, we're so currently we'll, setting we'll... that up with work as well. In which case, so, I will have free time. Yeah. So perhaps, <laughs> perhaps uh, we'll see if we can make that happen. That's it. Yeah. But it. it, oh, it I think really... it's. I think it's right in your wheelhouse, Ryan. It really Absolutely. Is. And it, it's, it's such like a if, fun. If you game. could take, if you could take me, and put me into a game, like turn <laughs> just transform me into a game. Uh, this kind of sounds like it. Mm. And I, like I feel. I feel that this game is a kindred spirit to me. For for me, it's very much it's the it, it's that that one nice comment when you're having a not great day that just helps calm 
yeah. everything inside you. And and that's what this game is. It just it just puts that hand on your shoulder and is like, hey, no, we 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 got this. Mm-hmm. And it, yeah. it's just it's such a, a fun, light, pleasant, and you you can take it to places that are bittersweet, um, but very rarely will it, it like it won't go to dark places. At yeah. worst, it'll go to somewhere bittersweet where you're crying but you're happy, and <laughs> <laughs> and it's just it's it, it truly is one of my favorite games. When awesome. I was a younger player, I thought that the only way to get and game master the only way to get feelings was to do grim dark. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know, Horrible, deeply horrible, shocking things happening. Oh, yeah. the number and of families so- of mine that that were left in charred villages before I started my yeah, adventure. Totally. And and as as I'm growing older and and looking at the world and and am very much in that hope punk kindness is a radical act. Yeah. Um. I'm. You know, kindness is not necessarily just softness and weakness. Um. And and going to be to be unironically positive about something that deserves to be positive, mm-hmm. you know, that, that we should lift up and amplify, um, you know, sits really comfortably with me. Absolutely. Um, there, there would have been a time that going, look, we're going to play this small game would be, oh, I'm, I'm worried that doesn't look tough enough. <laughs> that doesn't look, you mm-hmm. know, grognardy enough. And now it's like, no, <laughs> no, there is, a, there, is, there is a shortage of kindness and connection in the world. So... Um, yeah, there, there there is a there is a shortage of kindness and connection in the world, and anything we can do to reinforce and celebrate those links amongst ourselves as real people at a table mm-hmm. um, through a game that allows that to happen, I'm all for it. All right. So now that we've gotten that out of the way, take um, it up a level. Let's take it up a level. <laughs> My favorite segment title. Take that, Amelia. <laughs> <laughs> Take it up a level. Take it up a level. Puns are life. There's no bad pun. Uh-huh. In this segment, we will cover character advancement and growth in the system, uh, if it has that. Uh, but first, let's see, uh, how do we think uh, characters change as people within the narrative of the game? So how do, we, how do our characters grow as people as we uh, play through this game? Well, in the so this is this is the biggest gap between the demo version and the full version. So in the uh, demo version, it kind of roughly indicates how the connections work, but in the full version, the connection is right really the re- the meat and potatoes mm-hmm. of that, where you have the connections flowing to and from your character, and as mm-hmm. they deepen and become richer, that is what gives you those two resource pools of wonder and feelings that you use okay. to power your henge magic and power your abilities mm. and um the, you you really our characters grow by spending time in those connections with each other and with the village and with the npcs that we've created so it says to you you know like if for your character to grow go and be with these people and explore that connection. And mm-hmm. there's that mechanic of you offer up, I would like to deepen that connection between, you know, this NPC, you've just done this great thing for them. They're going to offer up deepening that connection with you. Do you accept that? Yes. What's the one word adjective we want to use to label that connection? And that's where you get those arcs of, you know, moving from uh, rivals to respect or, or, mm-hmm. or moving from... Um, you know, affection to uh, to acceptance or potentially love, um, friendship to family, and, yeah, mm-hmm. um, and you know that that love might be I, I, you know, if you were to play a young kitten with a young child um, and help them through their small child challenges, and they move from being you know really affectionate towards their kitten or their puppy to go, and if you've had kittens or puppies when you're a kid, there's that moment where you go. No, this 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 animal is not just an animal anymore. They are a part of my my life, my family, my people, mm-hmm. and and so you. Every one of those connections is an arc that deepens and strengthens. And there's a lovely mechanic that when you fill up, for want of a better word, your connection to a character and their connection to you, you kind of colour in all the way across the character sheet, and it becomes a thread. Mm. Uh, that's like in in another game that would be like a, a castle or some huge 
uh, asset that mm-hmm. you've created for this character. Uh, in this game, that becomes a, a an unbreakable relationship that now exists and carries forward from tale to tale to tale. Oh, nice. And again, I love, I love how the narrative influences the mechanics, influences the narrative, influences the mechanics. Because mm-hmm. th- there are times in RPGs where the story you're telling and the mechanics you're using to tell the story don't necessarily line up and you have to drag them together kicking and screaming. And here it really is a very purpose-built system to create this this narrative flow, but also this this sense of a growing connection to the wider community of this town Mm -hmm. that then just builds and builds. And within that, it provides you more wonder, more feelings, more dreams that then feed back into growing those connections and fostering new connections and so on and so forth up the the evolutionary ladder until ultimately, I think, if you were to keep playing and playing and playing, you would just have a sheet covered in threads and everyone in the town would be attached to you in such a meaningful way that... I, I'm not sure what you would do after that. Mm-hmm. Transplant the entire town into a city and keep growing. <laughs> yeah. I, I I guess if you run out of people to have permanent connections with. But you, even then you can't run out of people because those people will have more people. And then you start uh-huh. it again with the little ones. Mm-hmm. Our exactly. town has five people in it. So this will <laughs> be a fun campaign. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Um, so, do characters level up in Golden Sky Stories? Not really. Th- th- what levels up is your connection. Okay. That is, that's where the arcs are vested. Right. They're not vested in you collecting the full power set because they're largely on offer to you from the beginning. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and they do know. increase your wonder and they do increase your feelings and then... Uh, you can also increase your dreams and utilize all of that to be able to do bigger and better and more exciting things more often. Mm-hmm. But it's not about reaching, you know, XP to reach level three or level four. Um, right. It's about, it's how would you describe it? It's about gaining XP, XP to create more XP, to gain more XP, to create more XP, to gain more. Which, it, is, which, is, ex, which is expressed as... Connections. A, a connection. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's like saying, how can I put this? You know, your characters are leveling up and getting to know the bard that runs the tavern over the yeah. campaign. Yeah. And years later, when you look back, you talk more about, oh, I love that bard. That, you know, do you remember how we used to hang out in her tavern and how awesome she was? Yeah. Um, Just kept and this tossing is, those and coins this, to those witches. And, yeah. And this game is saying, well, that tells us that the leveling up of your character was at, uh, mm, that the relationship with the NPC was as important as your leveling up. Mm. So let's not yeah. worry about that leveling up and let's just make the deepening and enriching of that relationship with that NPC the point. Mm. Yeah. And I guess I guess to to draw parallels to D&D further uh, that state we talked about in the past where all connections in the town exist and all those connections have turned into threads, that'd be like level 20 plus. That's where you've mm-hmm. maxed out everything and now you're just going on adventures. Um, yeah, and they're not going to a happiness coma. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, and it, it, it Everything before that is is from you know level one up to twenty of you of you growing your understanding of your character, your understanding of your party, and also your understanding of the town and your connection to that town, and yeah. that's the the level mechanic, which is it, again it, it's it's a very almost cooperative level mechanic and mm-hmm. and encourages you to not think of it as me leveling up my uh, existence. It's about us. And the town as entities coming closer together, mm-hmm. and the closer we get to each other uh, in these connections, the higher a level we all collectively now are. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. My goodness, <laughs> <laughs> there, there's so much good stuff about this game. You know, like we are. This game is about being all in. We're all in this together. Mm. Yeah. And like right now in the real world at this point in time, that that's a thing that's ultra true. Yeah, absolutely. 
we need to to remember to take care of one another and to to make sure that we're safe and and our loved ones are safe. Yeah, very much so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the the this COVID nineteen virus is something that we might catch as individuals, but it's about who are we collectively going to become in the face of it. Mm-hmm. Very um, much so. And and there's one thing that I was talking to to my sister about recently where it almost becomes it's not about am i susceptible or am i not am i high risk or am i not it becomes about what am i going to do to reduce my risk of gaining the infection not necessarily for me but for me then being able to pass it on to other people it becomes Mm -hmm. your civic duty your point of kindness to be able to say no i need to step back from these gatherings on the off chance that I, as a healthy person, will pass it on to someone who is more at risk. Mm-hmm. Well, I know that we have to wrap it up. So, um, David and Morgan, thank you both so much for joining uh, us to carry characters for Golden Sky Stories and joining me today to talk about Golden Sky Stories. Can you go and remind, uh, go ahead and remind everyone where they can find you online and what sort of things you're working on? Okay, uh, well, I, I can certainly kick that off by saying uh, at Morrigan Jenk, Morrigan, like the witch, Jenk, like the first couple of letters in my last name, is where you will find me. And uh, you can also track down my podcast, Going In Blind. It's got a season out, and at some point in the next hundred years, we might even get a second season edited Ooh. and put together because it's sitting there in raw audio <laughs> on my computer. Uh, I was also a judge on Geek Wars. I am the interstitial singer on DMnastics. Uh, I have been interviewed on Dungeon Master's Block and the Young Justice Files Whelmed podcast. And I'm also mm-hmm. a voice on We're So Bad at Adventuring. Mm-hmm. And I might have a secret Golden Skies Stories podcast in the works. Shush. <laughs> and I am best findable online at my Twitter, which is Tigranosaurus1, mm. uh, as in the beginning of the word tiger and the end of, Tigrana- of Tyrannosaurus Rex, uh, because reasons. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's Tigranosaurus1, because unbelievably, I wasn't the first person to have uh, chosen that as my name. Uh, yeah. And Hopefully, at some stage in the not too distant future, there'll be a Golden Sky Stories podcast, um, potentially featuring some people who are around this microphone on it. If we can make that happen, absolutely. Well, thank you both so much again, and thank you to our audience for sitting down to listen with us, uh, to listen to us. Actually, mm. um, we will see you next time. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia Antrim, and I can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning or on my other podcast, Garbage of the Five Rings. Our other host, Ryan Bolter, can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune, or online at lordneptune.com. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero, Remix, by Steve Combs, and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Amelia Antrim. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can be found in the show notes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review, we have links to various review platforms out there, including Apple Podcasts, in our show notes. Also check the show notes for links to our other projects. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time. Now we gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. 
If you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com, where you will find other great shows like All My Fantasy Children. Each week, Aaron Catano Saez and Jeff Stormer take a listener submitted prompt and, using some of their favorite tabletop RPGs, create an original fantasy character. Along the way, they share laughs, stories, verbal hugs, and populate a shared universe one story at a time. I did it. Oh, oh and it's recording. I remembered to set it to the right microphone before we recorded. Oh, good job. I know. Thank oh, you. Oh, gosh. That, that was just even better than I could have imagined. <laughs> I, I'm going to eat more Pop-Tarts. I have to have 300 calories, okay? That's like two Pop-Tarts. I don't know how many calories in your... I, my... Oh, we talked about this. That my doctor was like, a banana has 300 calories. And I was like, That's Dr. Heaton, true. it does not. And I don't know how you became a doctor. Because <laughs> um, you don't know... All language. ...about bananas. That would be three bananas worth. Um, See, really I'm not eating banana. three bananas. That's what I okay, said. I think that, she's I, thinking yeah. of plantains. That was one, that was one medium banana. Um, let me go for extra large, nine inches or longer. 135 calories. <laughs> We're all perhaps, thinking it. It's fine. Perhaps, <laughs> it's, perhaps yeah. your doctor was talking about the big banana, which is an attraction in Australia. And if you I, Maybe uh, that's it. She seems like a well-traveled lady. Exactly. There is a 225 gram, one cup mashed banana. That's 200 calories only. See, I ate a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I ate one of those little Uncrustable sandwiches. Yesterday, it was only like 200 calories. So it says nine inches or longer and 152 grams. Where does that sit in the kind of FCC guidelines about what we're allowed to talk about? Oh, it's 100% permissible. We're talking about yeah, fruit. We, yeah, we can yeah. talk about bananas all day long. That's fine. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of different sizes of bananas, and it's fine. You can eat whatever one you want. Yeah, and they're, uh, they're all natural. And there's you know no what? Such thing as an average banana size. <laughs> And I think um, it's important to note that some people don't like bananas. That's yeah. true. This yeah, is true. I, I personally the closest to average is a medium sized banana at seven to seven and eight, seven and eight inches long. Well, I think there are uh, some there's there are some people that that can't have bananas if they have a like a latex allergy. I have a slight allergy to bananas. It's not mm. bad. I can still eat. I gotta bananas. go put my kids to bed. I'll be right back. Okay, but but they tingle my throat a little. Yeah. I, I have um, that with carrots, um, and, and then with avocado, it, it just kills me. Oh, that's not good. No. Well, that's, yeah, that means you can save up for a house, though. Well, that's it, yeah, because I can't eat avocado toast. So, I, well, I don't have to save up for a house. I This is mine. Um, so it, it already worked. My lack of avocado. second one with your avocados. There yeah. you go. Yeah, like I am the proof that all those boomers who are spreading that, that rumor, that they're, they're telling the truth. Yeah, so Ryan, huh. one of our political leaders... Um, when being asked about the fact that, shockingly, it would appear that young people who are coming through aren't earning enough and saving enough to be able to buy a house, he said, well, that's because they're spending all their money on avocado toast. Wow. That's that's a lot of avocado toast. Yeah. It's that's... amazing how many people made that calculation on Twitter within minutes. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. <clears throat> but, yeah, no, I, I, I can't have avocado toast and and I, I have a house. Well, the bank has a house. Yeah. I, I just get to live here. So I want to say that there is an anonymous auric and an anonymous jackal uh, looking at the uh, the sheet, and I'm not sure which is which. So nice. To, to, I'm, I'm guessing I'm one of them. One is. Oh, an auric. I think. Well, it. I can see that an anonymous auric is watching, and character creation cast is watching. So, oh, anima, anonymous auric is typing. Yeah, I'm down oh. at guests, so I'm, I'm highlighting guests at the moment. And oh. I'm going to... So I think you're Jackal. Jackal. It's a Jackal. 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 Yep. So David's the Jackal. Whoa. David grar. the Jackal. Grar. I don't know if that's what a Jackal... That, that is. Yeah. And then David, David is also the... What was the other thing? The Auroch? You're the Auroch. Oh, no. Auroch. No, you're a- the Auroch a- as well. A- A-U-R-O-C-H-S. I don't even know what that is. See, these... It's- oh, we should... It's like Sent- a type of bowl, I think. We can put. Um, we should be submitting descent into midnight deep sea creature suggestions to Google, so you could have like um, anonymous goblin shark. <laughs> I've got. I've I've done a one 
Uh, character suggestion. Every single day since they like announced the Kickstarter. Or I've been like loving that. them. They've been uh, great. Uh, thank you. I've been having so much fun thinking about them. Uh, I didn't have enough room for my latest one, though. I ran out of Twitter characters. So can I pitch you the campaign I want to run? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I want to run a long... F- you'll, you'll pick up a theme in the things that interest me and what I think we need to put in the world, Ryan, is um, I want to run a long-form Descent into Midnight campaign where the existential threat is a thing called the fade. And the fade is people just don't care about each other anymore. Um, oh. And you've got to work out like the community's just coming apart because people just, you know, a loved one of yours starts to get the fade and they just start to love you less and your family less. Oof. Start, not not depression. Yeah. But like they just, their capacity just, to feel emotions just fades. Yeah. And when everyone gets the fade, the community falls apart. Yeah. Yeah, that's brutal. See, I think I said to you in a tweet once that I think this game is spiritually related to Descend into Midnight, and I'm happy mm-hmm. to say this again when we kick off, that this is also about a game about community and connection. Mm-hmm. The core mechanic is when someone else does something kind and lovely and we like that, we just give them a token oh. and say, that was a lovely thing that you did. Yeah. And those build up, and then I use those to make connections. I ask whether you would like to strengthen your connection with me and- the guide might say mm. NPCs want to strengthen their connection with you. Mm-hmm. And at the beginning of each scene, we, we effectively power up equal to the, the strength of our connections to and from each other. Oh, wow. That's so pretty it, cool. It, it absolutely mechanically says to you, form deep, meaningful connections with each other, help each other, help the town. Yeah. And it's very small scale. They're very, it's, it, you know, descending to midnight is huge, earth-shaking stuff. <laughs> Yeah. This is stop talking, she's here. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, you're right. <laughs> like it hasn't I mean, been recording this whole time. <laughs> who has an eleven inch banana? I mean really. I mean, come on. <laughs> Nate has his first like competition thing tomorrow. Um, and he's like so nervous and he's like making me pick out which button down he's gonna wear and uh-huh. which sweater goes with which button down. Uh-huh. Um and he's eight. It's like that's adorable. He looks like a little old man when he wears sweaters. It's very <laughs> funny to me. Yeah, I have twin eight-year-olds, so when you were talking about you can't see how messy my house is, it's like, oh, Amelia, I feel you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my kids are only here half the time, though. So The rest of our house is actually clean because we're getting a puppy tomorrow. Puppy. What? Puppy. Oh. She's the coming home tomorrow. The fluffiest looking thing in the world. She's so fluffy. I'm so excited. So excited. Yeah. I'm excited for all the, the puppy pictures that you'll be posting. Sure. Oh, yeah. That's that's all my Twitter is now, is just pictures of Winnie. Uh-huh. And and then when I get my own puppy later on, because it's a different puppy. Yeah. Because I'll be getting my own puppy in a couple months. Ooh. It'll be pictures of that puppy, which I think I'm going to name either Peggy or Midge. <laughs> oh, interesting. They're very old school names. Yeah. Mm. Like harkens back to like the, the 40s or something. Mm-hmm. Nice. The kind She's of a classy lady. Yeah, cl- classic names. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Classic. Should we record a podcast? Let's do a um, podcast. I, mm, if I you mean, we can. Let's make right. some people. Let, we got to talk Wait. about making people before we can make some people. That's true. We already talked about the bananas, so right. we're halfway there. <laughs> <laughs> At least half. <laughs> <laughs> Not enough calories. Not enough calories in. No, I'm still eating these pop tarts. I'm gonna have to mute my microphone. To look up, I was trying to look up calories of pop tarts for you, and then we talked about bananas, and I got sidetracked. Banana pop tarts. Next time I'm at the gym, they should make be, those, uh, right? Like, don't they make like strawberry ones? They could totally make bananas. That's what I'm eating strawberry right now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a, okay. They make like gross like milkshake frosted? ones. Unfrosted. I'm assuming frosted because that's the good one. Yeah, obviously, unfrosted yeah, pop tarts are like unfrosted even pop bother? tarts. Unfrosted ones in a unfrosted pop tarts have more calories than a frosted pop tart. Do they like dip it in extra sugar or something? What, they must put work? more filling. In, they probably put uh, more filling yeah. in there to make you feel uh, less yeah. sad about it. Yeah.
They're like, you know, know, you're eating an unfrosted Pop-Tart. Have a little more jelly on the inside. Yeah, but I mean, like that doesn't make sense to me. It's like, oh, so you don't want your sugar on the outside. We'll put it on the inside. There you go. Well, yeah, because you don't see it then. You can't see it. Since you don't see it. As long as it doesn't have sprinkles, it's healthy. It's the, like, it's the one-year-old, like, mentality of Pop-Tarts. Oh, it's object permanence for pop tarts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not there, so the calories must not exist. <laughs> That's just science. That's yeah, science. <laughs> yep. We don't make these rules. We just live by them. No. Yeah. Waves so, go in, waves go out. You kind of to answer your that. question, it's it's two hundred calories for a strawberry pop tart that's frosted. Fantastic. Okay. Well, I have two of them here, so, so that's, that's 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 enough calories then. That that's is. Having yeah. started going to the gym recently, it is Why? absolutely soul crushing to see, like I walk jog for an hour listening to podcasts, and it says you've burnt thirty calories. Like not quite, but there's that kind of emotional looking mm-hmm. and going, oh my god, that's. I worked not so a- hard. Yeah. That's but- not even a banana. <laughs> I know. I'm going to, I will turn to the guy next to me and say, I don't like, that's not even an inch of banana that I've worked off then. And I had a big one just before. <laughs> Seriously. <sighs> well, I've got kinda, nine inches makes to you- burn off. I'm so I, I think, okay, so here's my theory exercise is only there to make you think about eating less. Because you're like, Wait, I could have this 200 calorie dessert, banana, banana, 200 calorie cup banana of banana pudding, right? Yeah, banana pudding, like a whole cup of it. Because I looked that up, or I could jog for two hours. I see. I don't think that's the case. I think I think it's there to make the food taste better. In the same way I mean, that if you're not thirsty and you have a drink of water, it tastes like nothing. And why are you doing this to yourself? But if you're thirsty and you have water, it tastes amazing. So I, I feel like it's like, look, I'm going to have a family-sized pizza and the guy delivering it's going to make eye contact with me and we both know there's no one else in here. It's just me and the cat. But before I do that, I'm going to go, you know, jump on a trampoline for an hour with people that look very different to me. <laughs> and well, right. and that's going to make the pizza taste better. I guess that's... There is no joy without sorrow. <laughs> <laughs> there is no pizza without a treadmill. No joy without that's sorrow. True. And your pop cards. To- Pop tarts can either come with the sorrow frosted on the outside or hidden, <laughs> or on, the or hidden on the inside. Absolutely. I prefer my sorrow on the outside. <laughs> yeah. So I have to be honest. I don't even know what I to w- say to that. I don't even know where to go from there. Yeah. I would. I. I know. I'm kind of fanboying at the moment and would happily just talk to the four of you. I have no children four in the us? house. What happened? <laughs> There's four people over there. Oh, I'm one of them. Holy. Oh, shit. language. <laughs> Oh my god, I'm in this. <laughs> <laughs> There's not five people, David. That's Your you. face is so red right now. It's okay. I know. I'm having. Have a- you heard our outtakes? <laughs> we are an embarrassment to ourselves. That's not even all. You the can't. Outtakes. You can't hurt this. <laughs> no. This is already. This is already broken. <laughs> Honestly, like, and I said this to you before. I'm going to say it again. You are the most professional out of all of us here. In terms of podcasting, trust me, you are fine. You're in good hands. We are all hot Yeah, and messes. that guy there, that guy I can see there who's also in the podcast, he looks like he's doing all right. I'm doing all right. See, we're all in different positions, I'm sure, because... Yeah, you point over there. The you are guy. pointing at my other monitor. Everyone is over here. Everyone's over there on you. Yeah, well, so everyone's so that, that can, way for me. So that I can see the screen. That's because you're in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I love you. I love you all, and you're wonderful. But uh, once my meds kick in, I only have till ten thirty. So let's Let's do do a podcast. All right, let's do this. I was just trying to see if there was an invert camera um, setting on my phone, so I could flip myself upside down. Here, here, let me do it for you. (laughs) There you go. This is what it's now. Now feels like home. This this it won't stay like that though. Every day. This is. All right, Ryan. Oh. And this is a joke up. only for us. Oh, my God. I'm okay. No. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Ryan the grown-up. Let's do this. All right. I can call you Ryan the grown-up, can't I? I'm technically a grown-up, yes. 
by right. by institutional governmental standards. Yeah, people you got put your an age on me and call me a grown up by default. I'm not allowed to be a grown sentiment. up. Yeah, me neither. Welcome to Character Creation Cast. We're <laughs> really excited you could join us. <laughs> <Just started. laughs> All right, I'm gonna do a five count of silence, and then we'll actually start. Start. All right, here we go. Here Welcome. come the fingers. <laughs> Start as you mean to go on. We've been bananaed. We've been fingered. Oh my god! <laughs> Family. <laughs> Family. <laughs> Ryan did both of them. It Here's the thing, months. though. Children don't know. No. <laughs> They're like, why are they talking so much about bananas? And we're like, because we're grown ups and we want you to eat healthy. <laughs> we do. Fruit is important. Potassium. Okay. Is super I'm so important. sorry, Ryan. <laughs> That, I had to do it. Do we, do we need? <laughs> oh, I'm dying. Do we need a second fingering, anybody, or are we good to go? I think we're good with one. Um, yeah. <laughs> we already got the silence, so that's I've all. I've got the hot for. flush going on. Uh huh. All right. Okay. I need to. I need to hydrate. <clears throat> I haven't figured out how to mute my microphone. There's like no. a. Okay, so uh, David, you have the same mic I have. Yeah. Have you ever tried don't try it now. Please Have you don't. ever tried turning off while you're turning off the mic while you're recording it and turning it back on? Yes. Does it work? It does, but you get a lot of microphone noise. Uh, and right. depending on the piece of software, it goes, Oh, that microphone has disappeared. Yeah. So I've done it once. Mm. This surface doesn't like recording. I don't know why. So I did it once, turned it off and turned it on again. Yeah. And it defaulted back to the uh. surface speaker. Ooh. And because I wasn't, like, I can't see Zoom right now. I've yeah. got the Google Doc and the five of us. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't realize until later that I was talking into my microphone and the surface had gone back to default. Oh. Yeah. Then I will never touch that no. button. No, I just cheated. I always put everything through the, the Behringer and then it had a mute button on it. So oh, I that's, mute that's things. nice. I might, I might then it pick one up. I might pick something up like that so I can have a mute button. Hmm. Like literally only so I can have a mute button. Yeah. Because I, mm -hmm. I hate having to blow my nose and I could mute this, but I cannot mute everything. audacity. Yeah. <sighs> Podcast problems. <laughs> All right. So now I'm getting fingers. David, enough with the fingers. <laughs> All right. It wasn't How about me, I just, it was that fifth He just wants to hear us say the word fingers a bunch of times. I know. No, no, look, no. the clicky was the high point. It's all downhill from here. Here come the phalanges. Phalanges. That's how my mom always says it. I don't know why. But that's how <laughs> mom, she always says your it. Your mom always says phalanges. Like all the she, time. Okay, so she's she's a nurse, so she does. Okay. Uh, for some reason. It was just phalanges. <laughs> there you go. And if we've if we've survived coronavirus, <laughs> a quick start and a cuddle. Yeah. But it's not going to be printed on toilet paper for sure. <laughs> no, it no, will not. No, that stuff's we, too pre too precious. We have <laughs> yeah run out of it at the moment in Australia. Not sure why, but that's that a joke that's going to last. That's a well, it's either going to last. Yeah, or, or we'll still have run out of toilet paper when this airs, and we'll be in even more trouble. So. Or That's if those of you in the post-apocalyptic future have discovered character creation cast, which you should, <laughs> and you're looking back and laughing at us going, oh, how little you knew. The toilet was. If only you'd had toilet rolls. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, they, they, although, speaking of, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if Australia had the toilet, toilet wars, considering that we have had an emu war. Yes, which and we lost. We, which we lost. Um, and I think we drew on the second emu war. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I mean... No, there's no excuse for that. I was gonna try and like make an excuse for that, but there's no excuse for that. No, it was it was it was us versus. There the is no excuse for Australia, Australia, honestly. <laughs> I feel a firm. Anyway, kindness is what this game is about, Correct. right? Yeah. Oh yeah, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Where did we leave off? Sorry, Nate is super nervous about this competition. He's having some some anxieties about yeah, it. Yeah. So what's the competition? He's, um, it's called Destination Imagination. Do you guys have, like, forensics? Like, we, um... We might do for, under a different name. What is forensics? Um, so it's like, this, it's a... Ryan, how do you explain forensics? So, so this is like, they're putting on a skit, and mm -hmm. they had to, like, build an invention, and then they put on the skit about their invention. Mm -hmm. Um, and they have to, like, be able to explain the thing that they made, and, like, 
do yeah. like a whole thing. That's like one of the categories of forensics. I, I was in forensics for a couple of years in high school where um, I read poetry. Uh, okay. It's competitive. Uh, it's a it's a competitive poetry reading, basically. Uh, yeah. So there's like speech and there's – so theirs is – like for this one, it's, they have the technical challenge. Okay. So they had to build something, but then they also have to like present it somehow. And so they chose to do a skit oh, nice. um, to present their – they made an outlet cover that's like magnetic and it opens and like has oh. a top and a bottom because you can never get the little like yeah, pluggy yeah. things out. It's pretty cool. That's that's pretty cool. Um, awesome. Why don't we have that in Australia? No, I don't. I don't know. We don't have it here either, except for this group of eight-year-olds that invented Aww. it. So um, they have the one prototype. That's amazing. Well, I, I, I mean, I meant forensics, but yes, that as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> forensics um, was lovely. I learned so much of how to like speak publicly uh, by doing forensics for two years. I love that this is like a miniature version of academic decathlon, which is what I did, because that had like speech and like you had to have a prepared speech and impromptu speech. You did interview and then you also had like however many subjects are left, seven other yeah, I know debate, subjects debate of like math, of science. Mm-hmm. Uh, in forensics, there was uh, storytelling, uh, which was like poetry, only you're reading stories. Um, yeah, yours was much more, forensics is much more like, um, like art, presentation. Yeah, artsy presentation um, sort of stuff. Yeah, academic decathlon was like reading math, yeah. science, art, I, music. I got to yell at people uh, for my poetry. Oh. I, I yelled at the audience that they weren't meditating. I believe nice. that that's a true <laughs> thing that happened. No, it is. Uh, because I, you yelling I, at people. I read poetry. It was nonsense poetry. So it was poetry that had no real sense to it. Um and one of the poems was about a meditation where he started off really gentle, like, this is a meditation. And he started talking about the different things. And and then it got really weird. And then the trees started biting the noses off of children and, like, started the trees started eating people. And and then he, he, like, snaps at the end of the poem and he yells, you're not meditating. Um, so I got to do that. Wow. That's kind of fun. It was a I lot of fun. I kind of like that. Yeah, and another poem. Um, the the narrator squished uh, an elf, um, like like little tiny uh, pixie sized elf, uh, because uh, he didn't like the way he was talking. It was we've it, all been it, there. It was very strange. <laughs> okay, sorry. Back on track. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I had to go comfort an anxious child. I'm back now. Where did we That's leave fine. off? Yeah. So we were we so just finished children, talking about. No, my children know about Nate, um, and so y- you can tell them tell Nate that um, Aiden and Zaria from Australia are cheering for him tomorrow. Oh, there you go. Okay, I will tell him. We should do. We should make them be pen pals. <gasps> <laughs> we'll talk later. We will. International pen pals. International it's a good plan. You just have That's to read it upside down in order to get that true. Right. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. I'll hang him by his toes and then have him read the mail. There you go. <laughs> Parenting done right. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, I have a picture somewhere when he's a baby of like me holding him like this, but he's upside down. Mom, mom, don't make me read the letter from Australia again, please. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so nice. <laughs> They've sent you another situation. letter, mate. Oh, no. <laughs> perfect situation for some help from a hen gay. Uh-huh. Yes, exactly. Absolutely. Thank you for being a grown up. Now we're now okay. we're back in it. <laughs> we're in trouble. If I'm the grown up, we're all in trouble. Oof. Um, well, it's been 14 years since it first came out in Japan. Oh, 2006 was 14 years ago. Yep. Uh, <laughs> Welcome to the uh, future. Why would you tell me that? <laughs> oh God, I'm so old. I'm sorry for all these facts uh, that are happening. That's what. Uh, that's I was in Beauty <laughs> and the Beast that year. That's that was a while ago. I was I'm, one year out of college. Very, I was still in high school. I had just finished high school the year before. I oh. am. Oh, we're almost the same age then. Yeah, or I'm really bad old. at high school. One of those two. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Who knows? I think about that sometimes. I'm like, I'm 31 and I already take eight pills a day and all of them are for my mental health. What's going to happen when my body falls apart? Uh. Like at that point, like, can they just can they just like zhuzh them up and just turn them into a paste? And I right, you yeah, like mix them with my bananas exactly, <laughs> so I can have my my banana shake in the morning and just yeah, put them in there. just stir them into my banana pudding. That's it. Yep. 
Because mm-hmm. then you get the calories as you're taking your pills. Yeah. Oh, see, that's not going to work, though, because I have to have the calories an hour before I take the uh-huh. pills. Okay. And you shortly need... before I summon an elder god. So I guess what you need to do then, <laughs> yeah, at least you're doing that on the regular. Yeah, uh, right. But what you need to do is you need to crush up the pills on the bottom of your cup of bananas, and they're just taking hours. By the time it. you get to it, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, see, good so plan. I, see, if I can... it's like a dirt cup, but pills. <laughs> <laughs> I realize I set everything up so well, except I didn't bring my pen. So I'm gonna go and get a pen. Back in a moment. Okay. Yeah. I gotta crack my back. Crack your back. Wait, if, if this is a break, I might nip to the bathroom just quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Go for break it. Break. Oh. Also, oh, oh my gosh, hello Ryan, it's been a while. Hello. <laughs> Everyone's gone. Oh no, Ryan's still there. Hi I'm Amelia. Still there. I was cracking hello. my back. I was trying to and mine won't crack. It's It hurts so mine bad. also will not crack. <sighs> so they moved us into pods at work. Mm-hmm. Um, like normally we are, we were in cubicles, like our own little cubicles and stuff, right? Um, and I say little as they were like, uh, let's see, four, about maybe eight by eight, eight foot by eight foot. Um, so pretty decent sized cubicles. Um, and now we're in these pods where our whole team is in one open space with- ta- I hate with, open concept with anything. tables all around the walls of the pods, right? The table, the 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 tables that we're on that are quote unquote our desks, they rise up and down, which is cool. But mm-hmm. uh, they gave us chairs that are only at regular sitting height, and the lumbar support on the chairs is fantastic, but the cushion on the chairs is horribly bad for sitting for mm. you know eight hours in a day. So it's like in theory these chairs would be fantastic, but now I understand why they gave us standing desks. So we can get out of those chairs and not be <laughs> stuck on them. Ugh. So I've had like just like a really bad like tension. I like I don't know if it's a muscle thing with this new medication or something like that because I've been like clenching my jaw too. Um, but I have like such a bad like ache in my shoulders now. Oh, yeah. Um, and now it's like moving down my back, so I'm very uncomfortable. Ugh. Well, I know, and I'm probably gonna have to like sit in like bleachers or something tomorrow yeah. at this competition too. I'm uh, gonna love it. That's never on the brochure about. Yes, I want to see my child, and then they're gonna run over to me, and you know the the unfeeling dad trope doesn't do justice to the fact that I'm sorry, kid, I just can't get up right now. I have no feeling below my navel. <laughs> right, right, yeah. It's not that I don't have feelings. It's I don't have feeling. Uh-huh. <laughs> just, just the one. Uh huh. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so I have a pen now because I am prepared. Um, so I think we're waiting. Are we waiting for? No, um, no. Oh, okay. I couldn't see you because we've got the dock up. Ah. So oh. okay. I'll put the. I can because mine, mine lets me see the dock and the people. Yeah, yeah. I moved I my. Dock well, I can see. I can only see whoever's talking. So oh, I have mine set up differently. I can see everybody. So you so can click. I, I could probably I I extend it, but view. I have set up yeah. the gallery okay. view. Yeah, it's not bad. Um, is that a is that a podcast? It is. It is a podcast. I think that's a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> My very own helpful Henge has decided to join us. Hmm. She knows if I'm sitting at this chair, I'm trapped, and she can get pats. <laughs> that is a very like like stiff tail too. Yeah, mm. which reminds me uh, very much of one of my cats. <laughs>